Storytelling is important to me because it's literally the oldest human thing. We've been talking to each other and telling us about our lives and about made up stuff forever and ever. It's the best way to communicate. Detroit, 1975. I was an anti-racist. It's five weeks after 9-11, and that means 15 days after the memorial service for my father, who was on the first plane. And her eyes start filling up with tears because I realize she's in shock because I'm passing as male and she has no idea. I really believe that you can't be enemies with someone if you actually sit down and hear them tell their story. I'm speaking to you in Spanish and you're speaking to me in English. Why? And she says, I thought you were one of them. It's Saturday morning and my sister and I put on our tackle football gear. Recently, I decided to go on the journey to go find my dad, a man that I hadn't seen in 30 years. The adrenaline is wearing off. I can feel a shooting pain in the side of my ribs. When I was seven years old, my dad was shot three times during an attempted kidnapping. We picked up everything, my family and I, and we immigrated to the US. We knew that it was better to be together than apart. When you're listening to another person's story, you kind of get wrapped into what they were feeling. And I, I really enjoy that. And there's not a lot of opportunities to do that with people that you don't know. Are you ready for some storytelling? Hello, and welcome to the Stories from the Stage Learning Series. I'm Liz Chang, General Manager of GBH and World Channel, and a co-creator of Stories from the Stage. Well, you've told us that you love seeing ordinary people telling extraordinary real stories of love and loss, standing up for a cause, adventures in the everyday, and shocking revelations, and even unexpected triumphs. You also love that our multicultural storytellers speak from the heart of their diverse communities and represent every kind of difference. Well, you can always check out worldchannel.org for the season schedule to watch stories based on a theme that's important to you, as well to subscribe to our newsletter and our compelling new Stories from the Stage podcast. That's right. You can listen while driving, shopping, and going to work. And now I'd like to introduce you to someone who has dedicated her career to transformative stories that can make a difference in our lives. Our longtime story coach and friend, the fabulous Cheryl Hamilton. Thank you, Liz, so much for having me. And thanks to everybody who's tuning in from home or the office or wherever you are in the world today. It's great to have you here to talk about storytelling, something that I love, we all love. And I'm really excited because I'll shortly introduce two of my fellow storyteller and friends. Um, but first, let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. So today is all about how do we take a really long story and make it short. And this is personal for me because I actually got into storytelling because I was invited by a gentleman to tell a story at an event. I got hooked and he said, well, I think you should tell that story as a full length play. So I actually, the first time that I traveled telling stories, it was with a 90 minute one person show. So when I left and retired that play, I discovered the wonderful world of storytelling where competitions like slams are five minutes. And I was like, I've been telling 90 minutes. So I'm gonna be sharing some of the tricks I've learned about how to take your life story or one of your favorite stories and shorten it down um, so that you could tell it at a slam, which is usually five to six minutes or on stories from the stage where we have six to seven minutes. Or if you're someone that doesn't wanna tell a story on a stage necessarily, but wants to tell a good story over the dinner table or wants to include a small story in a presentation at work, all the tips that we're gonna to share today will be applicable to those as well. But Talking about getting right into something, I'm going to invite our guest to join us today. First, we have Kevin Gallagher, who you may recognize from season one. He uh, appeared in an episode, and Kevin is tuning in to us from Vermont, where he lives with his husband and his cat. And he's a psychotherapist by day, listening to the insides of people's stories. Um, but outside of that, he stands on stages and shares his life with us as well. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Cheryl. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. We also have another um, Boston um, local, um, Julie Baker, who I met through storytelling at the Club Passim um, in Harvard Square. 
Julie is a storyteller, a writer, an advocate. She also appeared in season one. And luckily we got to record both of them telling another story recently, which was great. She's also the founder of Blue Shocker Stories, which has lots of programs, including a really special thing, which is that Julie every day posts a 99 second story. So talk about taking a long story super short. So she's gonna be an expert for us this afternoon. And our um, the, we're gonna basically conduct this like a conversation. And then we're gonna focus on four specific lessons that if you leave hear nothing else today, you're gonna to be leaving with those four lessons. But I wanna start by asking Kevin, how did you get into storytelling? I, I did it through a one person show, but how did you get into it? Uh, my partner, Michael, was in a regional theater production of Les Mis, and he was just having such a good time. He had never been in a play before. Um, and I, I, I got jealous. I sort of thought like, well, I wish I had something that like I could do. And probably a week or so later, he texts me a picture of a poster that he saw in a coffee shop that was talking about a story slam coming up. And he's like, you have some good stories. Why don't you go and do that? So I went, I, my name did get pulled out of the hat. Uh, so I got to tell, um, as you said, I sort of got hooked in a sense. Um, went back the next month, didn't get picked. The next month, didn't get picked. The next, then I was just on a mission. Um, and now all these years later, I'm still telling stories. And we're really lucky for it. All right, Julie, I know I met you at a slam, but I don't know if that's how you got into it. What's your backstory? I listened to storytellers at live slams and on the radio for a while. But a friend, we had tickets to a live show and she said, are you going to be putting your name in to tell a story? And I said, oh, I never do that. And she said, why not? And I kid you not, I heard a voice in my head say, why not? And I worked on a story. She told me the theme was parents. I had some pretty colorful parents. I put my name in. They picked my name. I got up and told a story and it was a high like nothing else I had ever experienced. And then I won the story slam. That also so makes it fun. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was very hooked and I just never stopped after that. Yeah, and um, both of you have been featured on national podcasts as well. Julie, I know you've had stories on The Moth and on Grit and um, and I think Risk even maybe, um, but yeah, it's so, oh, not Risk, you can still do that. Um, you should pitch to them. Um, and everybody listening, you should also pitch to stories. Um, some people think you have to have been doing storytelling for a long time. Many of us just fell into it, right? Um, it's stories from the stage. We love first time tellers. So we'll tell you more about how to pitch, but so since you've gotten into storytelling, something, and the reason I invited you today is both of you write every day. Like that is shocking to me. I, I'm happy if I write once a week. So tell me about how do, what's your craft as you develop a story? Julie, why don't you go? <laughs> sure. I have a commitment to myself to write a hundred words a day. A lot of days I write more than a hundred words. Sometimes it's connected to what my 99 second story will be. I have a list of prompts. I have a card deck of prompts. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes it's just what I see out my window, what my teenager says to me, what I see on a Zoom meeting. It can be anything, but I just write just as a practice. Fantastic. And Kevin, is the same for you? Uh, it is very similar, Julie. It's. Um... You know, it's ideas, it's things that I remember from the past that I sort of think, just take a few minutes and make some notes about that. Um, you, you might use it for something. Um, but also sort of as a therapist, I, I have to do case notes after every session. And so it's kind of summarizing. So we're talking about editing of stories, you know, summarize an hour long session into, you know, um, five or six, 10 sentences. Um, kind of requires that kind of editing down as well. Um, so, but I like I like to, because I feel like my mind moves so fast sometimes, I like to write things down. If you saw the number of pieces of paper, you would be appalled, but that's how I do it. Yeah. Um, I actually email myself when I have a story. Like if I, if I go start a new document, it's gone. But if I email myself, I could put a little email folder story ideas. So we all have our ways we get into it. Um, but speaking of getting into it, let's get into the four lessons that we want to focus on today, because obviously this, this session is not about how to make every story perfect. It's about how to take a great story and whittle it down for the greatest impact. 
So we're going to start from something that we talked and we agreed on, which is to, if you're worried about how to get your story shorter, one place to look really quickly is your beginnings and your ending, endings. Because we find often that you need to shorten your opening and your beginning. We often say too much. Kevin, can you tell us a little bit about that? Your experience with shortening and which one's harder for you? <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 I thought of that um, in anticipation of today. I, I find both of them hard. Um, and the Olympics just being on recently, sort of like, I want to be out of the gate uh, doing well, and I want to finish doing well. And so the beginning and the ending just seem really important. But my, my process is, um, I, I tend to, surprisingly, I tend to want a lot up front in the opening so that I have more to choose from and trim off. Um, very different though, the ending, I like not too much information because it's harder for me to trim an ending. Um, but it is easier for me to trim the beginning for some reason. Julie, which one is easier for you to craft? The beginning is definitely easier. Uh, it sometimes changes, but that's easier for me. I think of it as the focus, the sort of tightening the, the focus on the story. Like, what is this going to be about? And saying it in a grabbing way. And I also try to link my end back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. It isn't always successful, but I, that's my goal is to link it back to the beginning. Right. I find with the beginning, sometimes people just say way more than they need to. They feel like they need to like tell everything that got in their life that got them to that point, or they feel like they need to introduce all the people that are in the room, even though ultimately we're only going to pay attention to one person in the room of the story. Um, is there anything else you notice that people do in their beginnings that perhaps you, you would like, no, you might want to avoid that. I think, um, as you said, introducing characters that aren't pivotal, introducing too much backstory. I like it when people get into the story. The story is a moment. The story is a single event. I like it when people focus like that. They don't say, and I grew up and this happened and then that happened and then that happened. I think it's important to just dive into the story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kevin? Yeah. yeah, I would agree. I, um, I, I, it took me a while to figure out that um, everything in my story is a character. You know, like inanimate objects are characters, people are characters. Um, you know, I'm typically the lead character in first person telling. Um, but I think it's important to realize like, okay, this can't be Ben-Hur cast of thousands. Like it's, it's gotta have some few really important pieces uh, to go with. And the beginning really is there's, there's, and we could, we talked about this in other of our learning series, but there's essentially four key elements to a story. You need a universal theme or something we're going to all connect to. You need relatable characters. You need um, some action and arc, and then you need conflict. I mean, the conflict is what's driving the story. So one of the things I tell people, if you're trying to figure out is my story, how can I shorten it is how long does it take us to get to the conflict? If we're like still four minutes in and we're like, what is the story about? That's where the trim needs to happen. Um, but Kevin, we're actually going to watch your introduction to the story you did on season one because um, it's a great beginning. It gives some people some of these elements. And then we're going to ask you how you feel about it. Um, and folks, this is only the first two minutes. I encourage you to go afterwards and watch the full story so you can see what happens in the end. But we're going to watch two minutes now. As a psychotherapist, I see a lot of couples in my practice. And it amazes me how much couples like to fight to win. Like they actually, like I somehow don't understand if I win this argument or win this decision, then this is really gonna improve our relationship going forward. <laughs> but secretly, I also really like working with couples because it gives me a what not to do guide in my own relationship. So I'll watch a couple fight and I'll say, oh yeah, I do that. Yeah, oh, I, I better stop doing that. Or, oh, I should take a note. That really worked really well in a fight. So I'm not quite sure uh, when I'm finished telling my story tonight that you, will ha you might have less respect for me, but I'm willing to take that chance. I didn't decide to take on a fight with my partner. I decided to take on a fight with the United States Postal Service. 
Yes, that quasi-governmental agency was my Goliath, and I was going to be the David that slayed it. So to just give you a sense of what started adding powder to my keg, uh, we all know the first line of uh, questions, right? Is there anything fragile, liquid, perishable, hazardous, flammable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the next round of questions, are, do you need insurance, tracking, postage stamps, passport, groceries, a massage, a cold beer? You know, the questions seem to be somewhat endless. But I wasn't prepared a couple of months ago when I went to the post office to mail a single page letter in a business envelope, and I just happened to not have a stamp. So I get the first line of questions, I get the second line of questions, then the poor postal worker gasps for air to come out with even more questions. Are there any lithium batteries or perfume in that envelope? Well, my sarcasm got the best of me, and so I took it and I went, <laughs> well, I don't know, wouldn't that be kind of weird if there was lithium batteries or perfume in this envelope? Stone face, she said, sir, it'd be weirder, I'm not even sure that that's a word, it would be weirder if there was perfume or lithium batteries in that envelope, and I didn't ask you about it. I love this opening. And Kevin, I was at the post office yesterday and the gentleman in front of me had a lithium battery. I could thought of you. I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I love about storytelling. So there's things I love about this beginning, but you tell us your, your craft. When you were thinking about putting this together, what were you focusing on? Well, one of the things that a college professor, I, I had a paper that I had to write and I was really stuck on starting it. So I went to office hours and she said, just start the paper anywhere. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you don't have to start with the beginning, start in the middle or start at the end and then back fill, front fill, side fill, um, which gave me like a lot of permission, you know, to not have to start from the very beginning. So this story when it happened, I was already at the conflict. So I was sort of in the middle of the story. So then it was sort of like kind of going back um, to fill in the front and then figure out uh, an ending that I liked. And so coming up with the opening, I wanted to relate it to my job being a psychotherapist because one, I think people think psychotherapists are not normal people and actually we are, um, and they, we lose our, or whatever in the post office too. Um, and so I'm also a very visual person. And so I think of storytelling as taking uh, the listener on a trip. And so I try to picture looking out the train window, what do I want them to be seeing? Um, and so picking out those key things in a brief way, because you can't elaborate, um, uh, not if you've got five or six minutes, um, but in a brief way, but that there are enough kind of objects and characters and people um, out the window that you actually have a sense of um, that you're on a journey. And then, then my job is to kind of bring them to the destination at the end. Well, I think what you did, there was three things I loved. Like I knew who you were, enough about you, and I didn't need to know things like, that aren't relevant, right? You may be a fantastic fly fisher, but I didn't need to know about that for this story. So you kept it focused. I knew where the story was happening so I could place myself. And again, like you identified, like the conflict was so clear early on that I was, and it was relatable. We've all been there. So I, that's what I loved about it. Um, I wanna, we had a question from an audience that wrote before that asked us about endings. So I wanna ask one more question about endings before we move on to our next lesson. Mm -hmm. But there's a sense sometimes with storytelling and also with speeches that you need to sort of like make the point at the end. Like, do you need to give the resolution? Do you need to do the lesson is? How do you both approach your endings? Julie? As I mentioned earlier, I try to somehow bring it back to the beginning. I'm really not a fan of, and the moral of the story is, those, those are not stories that um, <laughs> get me. So I try to avoid that and I try to bring it, bring it back to the ending and sort of land it you know, um, have it be sort of a memorable line or at least feel like I've, you know, the train has come into the station to use your analogy. Kevin, anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I, I, I sort of, I, 
trust the audience, even if it's at a dinner table or you know if you're giving a presentation uh, for work. Um, trust that the audience is listening and is following and they will get to the destination without you actually dragging them. I mean, we don't see athletes, I'm stuck on the Olympics here. You don't see athletes say ta-da when they finish. <laughs> They just I was, I was thinking to say, I was thinking like pr movie producers or directors don't come on the screen after you've watched a beautiful film and say, so that movie you just watched was about, right? right you right. have to trust that if you've told the story well, if there's been a really interesting thread, good characters, you can stick with it. Now, if you are somebody who would like to say a few words at the end, that's sort of like what it meant to you, what we find is that can be done really well. If you watch um, one of our Webby award-winning episodes with Gastro Almonte, he summarizes his story. I don't want to give it away. You need to go look it up. It's um, it's under the, oh, they'll put it in the chat, the link. But Gastor has one sentence summary that captures the whole story. But what we see sometimes, particularly with new storytellers, is they have that beautiful ending and then they keep going. They want to be like, so do you understand? Trust. So I love this. So let's move on to our second um, lesson for everyone today, which is number two is tightening our transitions. So we've talked about the bookends of the story. What about the pieces in between? How do you both approach your transitions in your stories? I'm pretty much always working up the, to the climax, to the apex of the story. Um, and so, you know, uh, if you think of transitions as stairs, you know, I move this stair, this stair, this stair, this stair. Now we're at the top. Now I can then start coming back down. And so it's being very mindful of, does this step lead to the next step? And is it all leading to the conflict? Exactly, yep, I agree. Completely. Otherwise I'm sort of resting on a step or going sideways on a step. And, and that's where you run the risk of losing the listener. And I remind people like, if let's say you have a six minute story, right? You might have five transitions in that. And that includes your opening and your ending. So you're really talking about three or four you're trying to get through. It doesn't mean that every one of those transitions has to be action. A transition can be the emotional internal dialogue that you're wrestling with between the parts. And I know, Julie, we're going to watch a clip of yours in a second that does this beautifully. But before we get to it, what is your approach to transitions? I think I, I really like them to be sort of organic, where they feel like the story is moving along. I you know, we've talked about that I would have done things slightly differently in this story. I think back then in season one, where I was at with storytelling is I felt like everything had to be chronological. And so I have to avoid that the and then and then and then. So I think the transition to sort of take you from this emotional place to a different emotional place, or maybe what I learned or somehow move along without it being so rigid and manufactured. Again, we, we, uh, we were just coaching someone who was doing a, uh, who just recorded a story and he was being pulled over by a police. And he felt like he needed to explain every part of seeing the police, the police coming up, the police getting out of the car, the police at the window. And I reminded him that we've, we've, we know what that looks like. So that's familiar to us. We trust that if the police is at your window, they got to your window. What I'm interested in is about how you feel about it. I want more time in the rich emotional part of the story about how you feel in each section. So skip the parts about getting out of the car, getting to the car, just have the moment where that's the most impactful. But Julie, can you set us up? We're going to watch a two minute of the end of your story. Again, folks, please go look up these stories afterwards. We're giving you a sandwich version. Julie, what is happening leading up to this part of the story? What is happening is that a relationship that I thought was going to be an international Brady Bunch is um, not going well when I take my expat boyfriend from Denmark and his teenage children with my tween and teen to a cabin in the middle of the woods with no running water and no electricity and it rains the whole time and it's not going well. 
Great, let's watch. They wouldn't do anything. The resentment is building. The pond water, the rain's coming down. The pond water's rising, and the resentment is rising. And the, it's just rising. After one particularly bad night, sleeping back to back in our little twin bed on the porch and trying not to touch each other, I decide that after my morning constitutional to the outhouse, I will go down to the dock and I will meditate. And I will get in a better spiritual place so I can put back in the bricks of denial about um, this international Brady Bunch fantasy. So I head down to the dock. He didn't get the memo that I wanted to be alone. Um, so he shows up. I'm trying to breathe in five, hold five, breathe out five. And then he says, how you doing? And that was it. Um, the floodgates opened. I told him what I thought of his children's work ethic. I told him what I thought of his parenting style. I told him what I thought of the fact that he didn't get it. When I said I wanted to go home to get ice, I wanted to have sex with him in my house with no children around. And why the heck would he invite his 15-year-old daughter to come and take a shower in my house and make a mess of my bathroom? He told me exactly what he thought of my parenting style, which was apparently rigid, um, and how my children were not kind to his children. Our voices were getting louder and louder and louder. And then the camp manager showed up. I had known this woman for several years. I was mortified. She reminded us that it was 6 o'clock in the morning, and that when you talk on the docks, the conversation goes to the whole campground. I went for a walk, and I bit my tongue. The sun came out, but it was too late. It was dark and stormy in my soul, and it was not going to get better again. Uh, the Dane smiled a few times. The 15-year-old got a crush. The 17-year-old either stopped menstruating or figured out you could swim anyway. Um, they seemed to have fun. They continued on to New York City. Eventually, they went back to Denmark, and eventually, the boyfriend returned to his rightful place on my Facebook acquaintance list. <laughs> the following year, my kids and I returned to Ponkapog, as we always did, and I was really afraid. I thought the magic would be gone, that the Danes had soiled my happy place. But they didn't. And it never rained a drop. Uh, Julie, it just occurred to me that maybe, uh, you know, Kevin as a psychotherapist might have been helpful <laughs> in this moment. Um, but let's talk about the story itself. You cover a lot of time in that two minute little clip of transitions. Um, tell us what you were thinking about. And you also said you might have done it differently. What would you have done differently? I think your example of, you know, the police officer comes to the car. I don't think I needed to list. I tend to be a lister, and especially back then in my stories, I didn't need to list every single detail of the argument. I didn't, I probably could have left out the part about, you know, going home <laughs> to take a shower. I could, there were certain things I could have left out. I think you would have gotten the drift without me listing every single thing. I also am really struck by how fast I went. I think I was really um, concerned about time. I was probably looking at the clock and I felt like I have to race to this ending instead of sort of easing on in, you know? So I would have, I would have done that differently. In terms of transitions, um, yeah, I think it's just the, I could have said, you know, and I, I, um, you know, I left, I wanted some alone time. So I went to the dock. I didn't need to build in that. I went to the outhouse <laughs> that, that could have been left out. So the nine minute, 12 minute version. Great. We could have kept it and expanded, but not maybe that part. Um, no. I want to take a pause for a moment and thank you for joining us. Thank you for supporting GBH. This is a free series offered by Stories from the Stage and GBH. Um, it's our third. We hope you go look up the other videos. There's more to come. Um, but here at GBH, storytelling, as you know, is at the heart of everything that we do. It's what we believe is a great art form. It's a way to bring people together. It's a way to learn with one another. And so if you are not already a GBH supporter, which if you are, thank you deeply, we would love to encourage you to consider making a donation today. In fact, if you give $10 a month, <laughs> 
<laughs> props. That was not planned, folks. But I have a prop too, though. If you give $10 a month or make a $120 like gift right now, you get the stories from the stage journal. So you could start working on your transitions and openings and endings, as well as the mug. You get the two for today. In order to be able to give a gift um, and support the storytelling and keeping these great um, events coming, you can look at the chat for the link to make a gift directly on site or be really cool and take your phone and like do the QR grab from the screen. Very tech friendly around here. Um, but it's because of you and your support that we're able to offer these kinds of programs. And we're so excited because we are still f filming season five in the, um, at GBH and we're going to continue. And we just want to say thank you. So thanks for taking the opportunity today to do that if you can. All right, we've got two more lessons to get through. I also want to say to the audience, if you have a question, please put them in the, in the Q&A because we're going to do the next two questions. We're going to keep them short, long story short, answers short, so we can get to your questions as well. But Julie, you just introduced this idea of like, you wish you had choose maybe differently. Our third theme for everybody is you do have to choose wisely at the end of the day, when you're making a choice about what to include in a story, there's some tough choices because even if you have a rock solid opening and ending, even if you've tightened your transition, inevitably you may still have too much to work with. So um, Kevin, can you tell us about how you approach that part of having to choose content? Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to make me sound like I, I have, uh, well, I probably do have an anxiety disorder, but it's going to sound like an anxiety disorder. Um, I have a very formal process. So I write my stories, um, 14 point aerial font, one inch margins, three sentences to a paragraph, and a page and three quarters is six minutes. Amazing. I hope we get that in the chat. We're gonna <laughs> what's so, the final number? <laughs> Page and a quarter. <laughs> so for me, so for me, it's not a word count or anything, but sort of, you know, it will look different in its first go around. Um, but I, you know, like Julie said, you don't want to have to race through it. Uh, so that's where the selection piece is so important. But I know if I'm moving on to the third page, um, I am over the time. Um, and so it's really easy for me to recognize what is too much material because it doesn't fit in one page and three quarters. All right, Julie, how do you choose? I love that every storyteller has a different process. Mine is very, very different than Kevin's. I will tell a story. Sometimes I'll do some writing, sometimes bulleting. I'll tell it to myself with a timer and it invariably goes way over. So then I start hacking and I'm merciless. I say, is this detail important to move the story forward or, as I, or have I just fallen in love with my words? And those are the ones I get rid of. Right. Uh, what do they call it? Cutting your darlings or trimming your darlings in writing? No, absolutely. I mean, we have to all give ourselves like the moment of like, there's just stuff we like, right? And, and you have to remind yourself, this is one story. You can tell the same story at a different event, a longer version. You can tell a different part of the story later. Um, when, I was do when I was writing my play, which was about a three year period in my life, my director was so loving. He would sit in the room with me and he'd be like, Cheryl, just tell me stories from your life. And then at the end, he would say to me, so I'm not gonna tell you which ones I didn't like because they were all interesting. I'm just gonna tell you the ones that were the most interesting to me, which was another way of saying, keep this stuff over here, um, which gets us to our fourth lesson. And we're gonna get, we've got some great questions coming in the chat is when you're choosing wisely and after you've made all these transitional cuts, do you guys tell your story to somebody else? Because, you know, who do you, or who do you? Because we all agree that you should tell it to somebody. So Kevin, who are you telling your stories to? <laughs> um, my partner, Michael, is usually my first person. And the reason I uh, start with him is that, uh, talk about Julie, mercy, merciless uh, hacking. Um, he will listen and he'll say, yeah, yeah, it's not that great. Um, and I'm like, really like what part and he's like like a lot of it so i think you just like gotta keep going <laughs> so so um so i know at some point when he says um yeah that's good that's about as good as it gets is that's good that's good that's good um that that's high praise and so f finding a good critic someone who's not going to um fill you with rainbows and sunshine 
Um, Julie, tell us about who you share your stories with. I no longer share them with friends who are not storytellers because they just say, oh, that's so good. And that's not what I need to hear. So I share them with storytelling friends and my merciless critics are my children. I have an 18 year old and a 22 year old and they just don't even, my daughter will say, I was there, I already know that story, which means she doesn't want to hear it again. My son will, uh, on Zoom, will just have a totally blank face. He won't laugh at jokes. And it's it's really, really, really funny. And then I'll say afterward, D what did you like? And he'll say, that was funny. Or that was, he's just a really rough critic. And I'll say, what can I let go of? And he'll say, well, you didn't really need to say that. You didn't really need to say this. And it's really helpful. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, I tell stories to people, my husband, my friends. Um, I start by telling it to myself though, loud in the car, out loud. You have to hear yourself. Some people say, well, I ran it in my head. It doesn't take the same time in your head. It doesn't sound the same and you're overconfident. Um, and in stories from the stage, if you participate with us, you're gonna actually start by sending us an audio and people are like, well, can I send you my story? And I'm like, what, what do you mean? And they say a document. I'm like, no, 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 this is storytelling. You've got to, from the beginning, be telling it out loud because we don't talk, we don't write like we talk. Um, but let's get to some of the amazing questions coming in. Um, well, we just talked about the first one, Julie, they were asking about whether you practice before performing your story on stage and to yourself and friends, it sounds like you do. Um, yes. Is there anything else you want to say about this? Um, I tell stories to myself in a mirror. I have a very large mirror and I stand there and I am my audience. That's fantastic. I love it. Um, Carol wants to know, do you write your story down um, and practice? And if so, do you say exactly what you wrote or are you ad-libbing? All right, we're going to keep our answers short because we've got so many good yep. ones. Kevin? I, I, I write them down, but what I remember are the bones, um, not the flesh. Uh, the flesh will come to me, um, as one person told me once, um, don't worry about forgetting your story because it happened to you. <laughs> so it's like, oh, right. Mm -hmm. And Julie, what about you? I write the first line and the last line. Sometimes I bullet or brainstorm, but I put it away when I start practicing. Right. So I'm also I'm similar. I write my transitions. And then I write a couple lines that I just think are clever and well-written and I want to land them in the same to each time. But like Kevin, I trust I live my life. I'm going to get through it. Now, the three of us are in the same camp, but I do want to honor that there are some fabulous storytellers. Host Teresa Koken of the program, she writes hers out, but she writes, she's able to write like she talks. And so she's, she has that craft. So you need to sort of figure yourself out and figure out what works for you. But she would also tell you that even though on stage, Things might shift, things might change. She might say it differently and that's okay, but you need to know your, you need to know your arc and where you're starting and where you're going with it. Um, I didn't quite catch the number of words Julie writes, says Robert. It's a hundred, Julie, right? A hundred words a day? That's my goal. I usually go past it, but sometimes I really don't want to write. So I just stop when I get to 108 or whatever. Awesome. Carol wants to know, are you allowed to go over time when telling your story? If not, is there someone in the audience indicating time? So I'll just quickly answer this. It really depends on the place you're going. Um, if you're going to a slam, there will be some way to know. There'll be a sound, there'll be a timer, there'll be a host that will get close to you and hug you off stage. Um, and for slams, because it's competitive, you do need to stay in the window of time. At other showcases, um, like uh, that where it's not timed, uh, you can be more flexible. A, a producer though is going to say to you, we need you to stay between seven or nine minutes out of respect for all the other storytellers and for the respect of the audience there that night. For stories from the stage, we have a television show, it's 28 minutes with interviews. So you have to be between six and seven. Um, but if you're just starting out, just get out and tell because you need to start to feel what that time looks like. Um, Anonymous asks, do you, do you target your stories for specific audiences? Yeah, what kind of stories do you both tell and to whom? I like to run with the theme of a story slam and I don't worry about who the audience is. I'm really telling it for myself and if it touches somebody, that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, very similar. I, um, I, I, I can't just sometimes write a story but if a prompt is given, like, you know, like season one was, or that particular episode was um, um, Deadly Sins, 
you know, I sort of thought, oh, oh, I have a couple of those. Um, but I can't sometimes just randomly pull them out of air. So I do, I do like the prompts. Uh, when I'm working with someone coaching, whether an executive for um, business or someone getting in the arts of storytelling, I say, you really should come up with three or four stories in your toolbox. The more serious, the humorous, the, and then find two things that you're excited about telling. Because if you want to get on more shows or you want to get more practice, you just want them. And it's good also to force yourself to start telling more than one story. I've seen people out in the community that like they have their one story, they take it everywhere they go. And I'm just, they're great, but I'm like, what else you got? I want to hear more. So you should also be thinking about that as well. Um, Kurt has a question. Speaking of choosing wisely, how have you changed in choosing your stories? In other words, are you in a different place today as a storyteller than you were in the, when you began? That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Um, uh, yes, in the beginning, I pretty much um, held close to those those stories that I'm famous for with family and friends. Um, and then moving beyond that really moved me to the being a better observer of myself and life around me um, and committing words to paper. Um, so it did get in the beginning, it was sort of like, oh, I've been telling that story since college. Oh, I told that. Um, so it's a great place to start the stories that you're known for, you know, in your cohort. Um, and then, and then to bridge from there. Julie, you tell one every day. Hello. <laughs> They're little ones that are pieces. I'm kind of the opposite. I um, do not enjoy, and I, I'm sort of a purist. I, I don't um, believe in repeating a story. If it's for a curated show, okay. But for a story slam, I develop a new story. It might have some overlap with another story I told, but it's a new story. And I like to explore new things and the writing every day and the recording the 99 second helps me. A little event, I realize, you know, it can step outside of the box with the theme. In the beginning, the theme's parenting. Okay, I'm going to tell a story about my parents. You know, and now I think a little broader. Oh, we could go on and on. And I see that we're timing, wrapping up the time. I'll just say in my world, um, I used to tell the epics. I was like a lot of people that get into storytelling. I must tell my epic story. And, um, and since then, I've just realized we all have stories all the time. Um, I love telling stories now about fighting with my husband over a fork. Um, I like telling about taking my nephews on walks in the, you know, in the woods and the things we discover. So I think it's to give yourself permission to just start being awakened by paying attention to the stories around you, exploring them, trying them out. So again, to repeat, we want you to focus on shortening your, opening your endings, tightening up those transitions, giving yourself permission to choose parts to keep and the stuff to let to go away. And then most importantly, just start telling. And if you would like to tell, I'm gonna wrap up. Well, first, let me say thank you to Julie and Kevin so much. We can talk at length. Um, it was great having them on the program today. It was great featuring their stories online. Please go check them out afterwards. But I hope they also inspired you to consider to tell stories. We are currently booking storytellers for the next three tapings here in Boston. The themes are against the odds. Um, I just, they were just one of, uh, ch seeking justice and change makers. But a thing about change makers I wanna say is that these are gonna be young people, 16 or young adults, young professionals, 16 to 25 year olds. So if you know someone who's making change in their community, in your family, they made change in their own life, we wanna hear about those stories as well. And you can go to um, World Channel's site to to pitch your story, um, someone will reach out to you. We're gonna ask you for a really rough audio. It doesn't have to be polished, but we want you to be telling the story from the beginning. Also, if you wanna be able to see some other fantastic stories, we have an event coming up next weekend, uh, next week in honor of Women's History Month called Everyday Women. It's gonna be Thursday night, March 10th. It features four other fabulous women storytellers who have been on the program doing new stories you haven't even heard yet. So we encourage you to join that. And if you've been enjoying these learning series, we've got another one coming up in May. In May, we're doing a story about finding meaning in your story. The difference between an anecdote and a story really comes down to there being some meaning, some universal truth. And we hope you'll join us for that as well. And as a final remark, 
again, if you can make a don donation to GBH, we'd be internally grateful. Um, as you, the arts needs to be supported more than ever, and we appreciate your time today and any gift you can possibly make. So Julie, Kevin, keep telling stories and we'll be in touch to everybody else. Thank you so much. <laughs>